Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I am the Casual Driver and in the last video I introduced you guys to the Mark III Toyota Supra and we established a baseline for future tuning. In this episode I'll explain some of the problems we've seen and what causes them like excess body roll, locking brakes, oversteer, understeer, as well as how to address them using suspension parts, brakes, tires, and the tuning of those respective parts. After I've replaced and tuned these parts, I will run the Horizon Mexico circuit again to see how much time I can shave off with the new upgrades. At the end of all of this, I think we will be quite happy with the results. In order to understand why we're making these changes, as well as how they'll all work together in concert, we first need to have a basic understanding of how a car moves. There are three axes of rotation on a car, and all of the handling parts affect the rotation on these axes differently. The x-axis, or pitch, is the front to rear rotation of the car. Picture a car skewered left to right along its center of mass, so left door, driver's side door, to the passenger side door, rotating forwards and backwards around that axis. Braking causes the car to pitch forward, and acceleration has the opposite effect, causing the car to pitch rearward. The y-axis, or roll, is the left to right rotation, as if this axis skewered the car front to rear, front bumper through the rear bumper. Generally, the only things that affect roll are steering input and the slope of your driving surface. Some improper tuning setups can cause odd behavior on this axis, but we'll cover that later. The last axis is the z-axis, or yaw, which is the car's rotation about a vertical axis. This time, the car is skewered through the roof, through the floor. Think of a car set up for drifting that essentially goes through a corner sideways. These cars manipulate their rotation along the z-axis, and a skilled drifter can transfer between grip and controlled oversteer at a moment's notice. Since we're setting the Supra up to be a time attack car, our end goal is to really have zero yaw movement. Uh, there, there are some situations where you'll get slight oversteer going through a corner where it actually does speed you through faster than if you maintain complete grip the whole time, and that's okay. But generally speaking, we want to maintain contact and grip at all times. So we'll do anything we do will be to minimize z-axis rotation. So the biggest problem I had at first was definitely with the braking, but not in the way you might think. The stock brakes were just way too effective. I was locking the brakes on almost every corner I turned, and as a result had a ineffective or late turn in, or ended up braking too early, wasting time and speed. However, this isn't really the brakes' fault. I have an issue with my pedal setup I've been unable to resolve so far, where I have very little articulation on my brake pedal between zero braking and full lock, but only on non-adjustable brakes. So the stock brakes, the aftermarket ones, other than the racing brakes, which are adjustable. I've probably overlooked something, but so far my best workaround for this has been to swap in race brakes and tune the braking force down considerably. With the right level of braking force, I'm able to get full articulation out of the pedal, which allows me all the braking control and precision that I need. Now let's head over to the upgrade shop to get those race brakes so that I can tune them and dial in the most effective braking I can have. All right, here we are in the upgrade menu. Let's see, where's the brakes? There's the brakes. Okay, race brakes. And we install them. Okay, here we go. Now that I've got race brakes installed, I need to adjust them. I usually don't adjust the balance as it's not too often. I feel I need to make the front or rear more or less biased. And as for the force, I like to set that so the tires just start to lock up towards the end of the pedal travel. This will allow me the most usable movement of the brake pedal, and more usable movement leads to more precision and more control. The best part is, this approach can apply to anyone, whether you're using a controller or a wheel and pedal set, 
or even your keyboard. So let's start at 75% and see how the car stops from 80 miles per hour. Okay, here we go. I've got company here. Into third. We're towards the top end of third here. And... Brakes. And it doesn't quite lock up, does it? So let's adjust it again. We're going to turn it up a little bit this time. Let's try 78 and see where that goes. We'll start off in a nice laggy third gear pull here. Up to 80. And still not quite, I suppose. One more time. Let's see what we got. Let's run it back this way again. Another lazy third gear pull. Back up to 80. Stand on the brakes. And it just locks up. Okay, that's exactly what we want there. So I'll still need to do a little final tuning once we get up to the mountain, just because things tend to handle a little differently at different speeds, and I'll probably move the force up or down a couple percentage points based on how it stops or potentially locks up the brakes when I'm going into corners at say 120 or 130 miles an hour where it might lock a little bit easier than it does here at 80 miles an hour. This is basically just the the benchmark, the starting point of brake tuning. This this will be usable but if you want, you can dial it in a little bit further. From here, it's all about personal preference. Whatever you prefer, if you want a little bit more force, go for it. If you want less, do that. Uh, I'm not your dad. I'm not here to tell you how to set up your car. This is just how I do it. I get a baseline, and then I go put the car through the paces that I want. And from there, well, hopefully you'll have your stuff dialed in. Now that we've taken care of the only real issue that I've had with the car, let's get into the how and why of the car's movement and how we can address that with suspension parts. Now that we've learned how the car moves, we need to figure out how to make the car move the way we want it to. We already know that brakes and throttle control forward and rearward pitch respectively, but what do we do if the pitch changes too suddenly or travels too far for our preference? Well, that's where springs and dampers come into play. Springs serve to suspend the weight of the car, and dampers, or shock absorbers, serve to cushion the car and its occupants from the forces acting on the wheels, as well as to manage spring oscillation, tire contact, and weight transfer. While I'm sure the Mark III Supra is both comfortable and fairly sporty in stock trim, its consumer-level suspension just isn't up to snuff for our racing purposes. We'll swap in a set of tunable springs and dampers to stiffen things up, which will help my ability to manage the car's weight transfer, increasing handling across the board. This will also lower the car's center of gravity, lessening the force of roll and pitch, which takes some work away from the suspension. But what do you do when your suspension handles pitch perfectly, but still has a little too much roll? Well, I'm glad you asked. Anti-roll bars, as the name suggests, combat body roll. They're the icing on top of the suspension cake and allow the car to reduce roll independent of the springs and dampers. These bars connect the front and or rear pair of wheels across the car, and as one side suspension compresses, it levers the other side to do the same, keeping the car more level through uneven lateral load. When properly adjusted, anti-roll bars complement the setup of the springs and dampers, reducing roll to a desired amount without interfering with the normal operation of the springs and dampers. I usually only adjust sway bars after I've tuned my springs and dampers to where I want them, and a good deal of body roll will also be addressed just by having stiffer springs, and anti-roll bar adjustment may not be necessary in this case. Having anti-roll bars set too stiff will result in some odd handling behaviors, such as a mid-corner rebound effect that can easily result in a spin-out, 
or a lack of articulation in the suspension that leads to drastically reduced traction through corners. Another way to increase grip through the corners, as well as how to set your car up for different tracks, is the car's wheel alignment. There are three options to adjust here, and they all affect each other. Caster is the measure of how far forward or behind the steering axis is to the vertical axis viewed from the side of the car. So picture two lines, one at a 90 degree angle to the ground, perfectly straight up, and the other an imaginary line connecting the top and bottom pivot points of your steering. The angle between the pivot points and true vertical is the caster angle. Positive caster is when the top pivot point is behind the vertical axis and the lower point is in front of a vertical. The majority of cars will have a positive caster angle as it provides a self-aligning torque to the front wheels, increasing high-speed stability. The other benefit to this aligning torque is a smooth corner exit. Instead of turning the wheels back to straight, you simply resist the inherent aligning torque to create a smooth transition back to center. Neutral caster is when the pivot points are at a true vertical, and really the only benefit here is an easier steering input. But since we're playing video games, steering effort really isn't that big of a deal. Negative caster is when the top pivot point is in front of the vertical, and the bottom pivot point is behind the vertical. This effectively makes the front wheels behave like those on the front of a shopping cart, which results in a serious lack of stability and predictability. With this in mind, it seems a bit of a no-brainer to go with positive caster, and all we'll have to do is figure out how much we want. Caster has an effect on camber, and with each caster adjustment, we'll need to readjust the camber. As such, it'll make sense to dial in the caster setting before we adjust camber. A car with positive caster will experience beneficial camber changes through a turn as well. The outside, load-bearing wheel will gain negative camber through a turn, and the inside will gain positive camber. Tuned properly, this will allow the best tire contact patch through the corners. Camber is the measure of how far inward or outward the top of the wheel is tilted in relation to true vertical as viewed from the front of the car. So negative camber is when the top leans in, positive camber is when the top leans out, and neutral is when the top is perfectly straight vertically in line with the bottom. For our circuit racing and mountain driving purposes, we'll want to go with some amount of negative camber. Because the wheels aren't square to the ground, we will lose some amount of straight line traction, but we will more than make up for that with the drastically improved corner grip. As the body rolls during a corner, the outside tires will actually increase their contact patch, creating much better grip than the previous OEM suspension setup. The third and final adjustment is the toe angle. So look at your feet, point them both straight forward, and imagine lines coming out of each foot. This is zero toe angle. If you turn your toes towards each other, then you've got toe in. If you turn your toes away from each other, you've got toe out. Fairly self-explanatory. However, the way toe angle affects a car's handling is a bit less intuitive. Front toe in promotes straight line stability at the cost of a less responsive turn in. Rear toe also promotes straight line stability, but at the cost of an increased tendency to understeer. Front toe out allows for a much snappier turn in, but at the cost of straight line stability. Rear toe out promotes better traction through acceleration, but at the cost of an increasing tendency to oversteer. Zero toe results in minimum tire wear and power loss. In general, toe should be left at zero unless you cannot achieve the desired behavior with other settings. Increasing or decreasing toe makes the tires track out of alignment with the motion of the car, and the tires will essentially be fighting the direction that the car is traveling in, which will make them wear much faster. So now we know how to set up our suspension to keep the tires in contact with the road at all times, but what if it's still not enough to give us the traction we need? Speaking of traction, all of these modifications, as well as the car as a whole, will see a serious performance increase by upgrading the part that serves as the interface between the car and the road, tires. With the brake and suspension ability to handle more force across all axes increased, we're very likely to have reached or passed the grip limit of the stock tires. The solution here is simple. 
upgrade the tires to a stickier compound. In games like Forza Horizon 5, I usually keep tire wear and damage off just because it's easier on me, and if I want more realism or more of a simulator type experience, I'll switch to a different game. Because of this, there really aren't any drawbacks to jumping straight to the compound with the most grip. Generally, you'd want to find the best compromise between grip and durability because usually, the stickier tires are a softer compound and tend to break down easier under heat and stress. Race slicks on the Supra with stock power is most certainly overkill, but it'll handle like it's on rails, and we'll need it later when we add more power to the car. So now that we've got all these parts installed, and we know how they work in theory, I want to walk you guys through my tuning process. To start, I'll just drive around with the new parts installed, leave them at their factory tuning points, highlight the points where I feel like I want to make adjustments, and continue running and tuning the car until I'm satisfied with the way it moves. Coming in hot, and hear that squealing? That is the brakes locking up again. So we're going to turn that down a little bit. A little bit less braking force there. Oh yeah, I forgot. Brand new parts. It's at 100%. We'll swap it down to 85 and see where that leaves us. And here we are at the mountain. And here we are with the completely locked brakes. We did turn the force down a little bit. What else is... Oh. Oh, yeah, that's right. New parts means tires are back to their default pressure. And in general, lower pressure means more traction. So we'll try that instead of adjusting the braking force this time. It's a little bit of everything all at once, all at different times. It's a little confusing, but we're just going to feel it out. And here we've got just a little bit of brake lock. So we'll turn the braking force down a little bit more and see how that goes. Okay, still a little bit of brake lock. And then if you'll notice how the rear end of the car wiggles a little bit. Just like that. That could be a number of things, but we'll start by adjusting the brakes. And from there, we'll stiffen up the dampers a little bit. That should control both the compression and the rebound movement a little bit more so we don't have that wiggling effect. Hmm. So I've still got the braking force about as low as I want to put it. So let's try turning the tire pressure down, see if we can create some more grip here. Still locking the brakes up. I've got the braking force put where I want it. I've got the tire pressure turned down. What else can I check? Maybe a little lower on the tire pressure. We'll try that first. So my tire pressure is fine. I'm holding grip through the corners. My braking force is fine. It's almost at the end of being ineffective. What else is there? Ah! Well, when you lock up your wheels only under braking, sometimes too much negative camber can uh, make your braking less effective. We'll turn the cambers a little more towards positive all around. I don't really care for too much of a negative on the camber. And we'll see how that goes. Liking it so far, though. And still a little bit of a lock there, but I, that one's my fault. Okay, here we see that the car is kind of just all over the place. It started oversteering, sprung back the other way, and was a little shaky throughout the rest of the corner. So the springs are still at their stock level, so let's turn that up to a little bit stiffer amount. And also the ride height in the rear is higher than in the front. So if we lower the rear just a bit, that should help us on that oversteering. Through here with these reversed curves is a great place to test both your anti-roll bars as well as your damper setup. Because it's a lot of left-right movement. 
back and forth. So you'll notice that it was a little springy still on the, uh, the transfer from one direction to another. So we'll turn up the rebound stiffness a little bit. And that should help us not snap back from load on one side to center. We'll add some bump stiffness as well to slow down the compression. Now here, watch closely. It's subtle, but right there. You see the right rear of the car angle towards the left front of the car under braking. Just a little bit too much. So we'll stiffen the springs up a little bit more. We're getting to the details here, so it's a lot of splitting hairs. And we'll add a little extra damping so that next time I make that maneuver, it'll be a little less violent, less sudden of a weight transfer. So I'm actually doing caster last in this setup, which is uh, backwards of what I said earlier in the video. However, I was pretty okay with where the caster was at just as the suspension came. It was at five degrees positive, which I have no real problem with. But I saw a forum that said you should start at 4 and work your way up for Forza games. So I start at 4, we're working our way up, and 4 even feels dead. Dead steering, kind of a lazy input, not too much feedback for me. So we're at 4.3 now. The steering is still just not quite as responsive as I would like it. So let's turn that caster up a little bit more. Four and a half now, and we'll see what this feels like. So the steering feels better with every caster adjustment I've done so far, but it's almost there. So what I want to do is add just a little bit more, and we will see what that looks like. Now here, pay close attention to the rebound right there. It seems like I'm fighting something. That front anti-roll bar seemed like it might be a little stiff. So I turn that down a bit. And here, you can see that the rear of the car wants to push the car into oversteer. It compressed a little too fast. And then at the end of the compression, it popped back up. So we'll stiffen up the shocks a little bit on the rebound. Now here, notice how the car dives into the turns pretty easily, but has a controlled release back to center. I want to turn up the bump stiffness on the dampers just a little bit more. And that should help control that that turn in, the dive in, the lean. And see now it's a more controlled compression as we enter the corner. And a nice smooth return to level outside of the corner. Alright, well it seems like everything's tuned pretty well as it sits now. So how about we do a nice uncut run up and down the mountain pass, followed by a time trial at the Horizon Mexico circuit. Alright, here we go on the uncut uphill run. <sighs> Alright. And we're off to a good start, good launch there coming in very hot good turn in there good speed a little too much there but not to worry we're still fast that 200 horsepower just not quite enough through the uphill straights Decent line through there, carrying lots of speed. Mm, 
nailed the break in, but didn't need to downshift there. It's okay, the valve train will slow us down. A little tail happy, but good braking. Smooth and easy through the wide turns here. Oh, 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 good lord. Wrong gear, for sure. I'm sorry, valves. My pistons have just become official NASA satellites. Good thing it's a video game. Hard on the brakes, just a little bit wide. And rock it out of the corner. Smooth and easy, again through these long uphill straights, into a sweeping corner with a weird transition, but we handle it. No brakes necessary at that point, cruising through this corner. Indeed, the Supra does feel like it's handling on rails now. It feels easy. It goes where I want it to go. It doesn't do what I don't want it to do. Easy and fast through these reverse curves. Hard on the brakes into third. Come out wide and floor it. Stay in third. Brakes. A little bit wide, a little bit late on the brakes. Beautiful sunset off in the distance there. Try not to get distracted by it. little conservative through that curve there. Hard on the brakes here. Good shifting. Back in the second. And hammer down. Banking carrying me through the corner there. Snow thankfully having zero effect on the traction of my race slicks. Once again, hard on the brakes, turn in, down into second. A little bit too wide through there, but that's okay. Try not to slide off the cliff there. Brakes. Tried to carry all the way through the corner, messed it up just a bit. He can't hang. What'll he do? All right, that's the uphill, folks. And now it's time for the downhill. A little nervous, it always goes way faster on the downhill. Will our new handling upgrades be able to keep up? Let's find out. So far, so good. Endless grip. Where we're going, we don't need roads, apparently. Coming in 
quite hot. Didn't really need to downshift there, but we did, so what are you going to do? One of the downsides of going at absolute full send is that it is a lot easier to make mistakes. So while you do often end up going faster, you do also often end up screwing up. Prime example, that was almost bad. But we're carrying as much speed as possible, and things are going okay so far. No shortage of speed on the downhill so far. Very hot through here. Don't hit the brakes just yet. And brakes. That one, that downshift, I'm going to blame on the transmission. That downshift, I can blame on me. Hit the brakes, dummy. Still quite fast, though. We're doing good. Supra eating up the reverse curves with ease. Coming in hot. Wait for the brakes now. Got a little too excited there. Not to worry. We still have half a race. A little squirrely there. That'll cost some speed. Breaking just in time at the usual problem corner. A little bit tail happy there. It helps to rev match when you downshift, otherwise the butt kicks out. Speedy through there. Flat out through here. We don't need roads, evidently. A little too late on the brakes, I suppose. Turns out not needing roads has its downsides. Well, okay, back to it. Uh, not necessary on the brakes there, but better safe than sorry. You'll, you'll be a little squirrely after you spin out. Deceptively sharp turn in there. It looks wider than it is on the downhill. Flat out through here. Not there. Carry it in high third through this. And floor it. Easy peasy squeezy lemons for the Supra. Mild lag from the graphics card. And a little early on the brakes in that last corner, but it's better than my usual late braking and understeering into the bush. Okay. Well, here we are. We've done an uphill and a downhill. Let me get out of the way of the traffic here. Uphill and downhill, and honestly, the car feels really good. I like where we're at with it. Let's go do a time trial. All right, here we are once again at the Horizon Mexico circuit. We've installed the parts. We've tuned the parts. We went to physics class. We went to mechanical engineering class. It's time to put it all together and see how fast we can run this course. 
We're, I know it's gonna be faster, but how much faster? Strong launch right out of the gate. I'm impressed with myself for that. Rowing through the gears with ease. No problem from the first corner. Speeding up through these corners. Here comes my nemesis, the 180 degree turn. Brakes. Downshift, wide, then back to narrow, and then back to wide on the exit. And then we'll line ourselves up for my next nemesis. Tough braking, tough downshifting on that hairpin, but we go through it just fine. A little wide on the exit, maybe. Into fourth here, that's new. Brake appropriately with a little bit of lock. The new and improved Supra is cutting around the track like a hot knife through warm butter. No need for brakes there. And now we come around for the hot lap. Entering the first corner with ease, going through the first corner with ease. This thing is great. I have no complaints. I mean, I wouldn't mind a little bit more power, but don't worry, we'll get there. As it sits now, the car is well balanced, agile, and functional. Now, anytime I lock the brakes up, it's my fault instead of touching the pedal a little too much. And around again hotter than before. Downshift. Better, but still wide on the exit. Just a touch of understeer. graphics card having just a field day. A couple extra miles per hour through the final straight there. A break, a good time downshift with just a touch of tail rotation. Mid to full throttle through those corners again. Creeping up on the red line of fourth. Hard on the brakes into third. A tighter line this time around than before. Hard on the brakes again. Downshift properly. Stay right and tight the whole time. Not bad at all. No locking there enables a nice tight entrance. Graphics card again having a field day. It's okay, Rocky, you can go when you feel like it. No need for slowing down. Maximum effort. And across the line. Now we have a new best lap of 1 minute 20 and 4 tenths of a second. Compared to our previous stock record of 1 minute 30 and 4 hundredths of a second, that's about a 9.5 second improvement just from tires, suspension, and brakes. Not bad. Not bad at all, if I do say so myself. We've covered quite a lot in this video 
and it can be pretty easy to get lost in the tuning. And sometimes that's not always a good thing. But with that in mind, I'd like to paraphrase a quote I recently heard from my brother. Drive the flippin' car. At the end of the day, you can get by with non-adjustable suspension or a downloaded tune. I mean, they're popular for a reason. But if you've made it this far into the video, you must be curious about tuning your suspension. And to tune your suspension, you need to drive the car. Don't worry about whether it's exactly dialed in or not, or if it's if one thing could be tweaked a little bit better. If it's close enough, that's fine. Of course, you can always readjust these parts later if you feel that you need to. Remember, you're tuning so that you can drive the car. Don't get so caught up in the tuning that you forget to enjoy the car. All I really do when I tune a car is throw all the parts on and adjust them from their baselines accordingly. If you drive your car of choice long enough and pay attention while you do so, you'll begin to notice how each of these parts affect your car if you haven't already. A basic knowledge of the physics and mechanics at play, along with a little intuition and some trial and error, is really all it takes to make your car handle exactly how you want. Well, I think we've certainly covered enough for one video. If you're still watching, thank you so much for watching. I'll be back again soon with everyone's favorite part of modifying cars, the power adders. Until then, may your lines be clean and may your oversteer be intentional. Goodbye.